What changed? Uh, first, praise the Lord and serve Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't know. But that flip needs to switch a little bit faster next time. So, uh, I can't be going out, going missing that many shots. But uh, it's good that you know, the two, threes that I did make came at the right time. So, He's in this building against you guys. He's had games like that where he's making yeah, like right every shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's in this building. He doesn't do it every year. You know, Jeff is amazing. You know, I always give him a lot of credit. You know, he's so skilled in a lot of ways, and you know, we just need to continue to get better. He's a great camaraderie guy, a great locker room guy. And, you know, it's, it's just evident on the floor. You know, he's capable of doing it. You know, he played multiple positions on both both ends, and you know, that makes our life a lot easier. It's definitely good to do the same locker room. I don't know if you'd call him a straight five or anything, but what does his element give you that maybe you guys haven't had in, in the past of this boat? No, I think for his size, you know, he's very quick and agile. So, you know, I don't think in that aspect he's like a bigger Otto, a bigger Kelly. You know, he's a bigger three. You know, he's able to play the four and the five. So, uh, you know, we utilize him in a lot of ways. He sacrifices. You know, I think that's one thing that we're starting to realize over the last two games is that we have to set, everybody has to sacrifice something, you know, for the better of the team. You know, whether it's playing time, minutes, shots, guarding guys certain matchups, you know, whatever it may be, certain positions being comfortable or uncomfortable, you know, we got to be able to go out and get it done. What have you seen different in uh, John the last few games? It seems like, obviously, his name is in the headlines and stuff like that, and he's responded very well. Yeah, I pissed him off, man. That's your fault. So he's going to come out and play like Wolf Wall. So that's what we need him to do. And I'm happy you guys kind of really were playing up on him. He got us going. He got us all going. So, uh, you know, he's just, just, you know, it's John. We need him to do that. We need him to lead the ship, you know, lead us and continue to bring it on both ends. And I think when he gets after it defensively for us, I think it gets everybody else going too. For the first four weeks, you guys had the third hardest for the schedule. Now with. Um, you're in the stretch of teams that are under 500, but how important is it to kind of bounce back, especially when you're at home for a extended stretch of time? I don't think we can afford to look at anybody's <laughs> record right now and <laughs> critique them or whatever their record may be because we're under 500. But, you know, we still, it's important we got four more at home you know, during the stretch and we got to get all of them. You know, definitely one at a time, but, you know, we, uh, I think every game is more than capable of winning, and we gotta we gotta make sure that we go and get it done. I know with the same effort we had tonight. Well, Brian, from your the first winning streak of the season, no pressure. But have you all found your identity? Or are you still trying to figure it out? I think we pretty much got it. It always starts on the defensive end. You know, being physical, being tough, being ready, and getting out in transition and going. You know, we're a fast-paced team, and we're unselfish. And, and so we just gotta just continue to not get bored with it. You know, don't get bored with success. Don't get bored with working. And, you know, continue to push each other, continue to get better, watch film, critique ourselves, and you know, every time we step onto the floor, knowing that we we have to sacrifice for the good of the team and do whatever it takes to win. Our teammates. I mean, we got shooters. We have guys that have to. Get respected with their shooting ability. We got Brad on the weak side. We got, um, you know, Keith down there, Austin, Kelly, whoever's in the game. We have guys who can score. So it keeps everybody at bay. And uh, with John, with his speed, getting downhill to the rim, you have to, you have to help. So it opens. He makes the play. How's it different for you specifically when you're playing with those small lineups compared to when you have a conventional big out there? It just depends on who we play. Um, you know, it depends whether or not I'm switching, whether or not I'm in another coverage. We just have to all be on the same page. What, what was working so well for you? We communicated. <clears throat> um, we were in the right spots uh, to get stops towards the end of the game. And uh, we helped each other. So it's been a uh, struggle a bit with the, uh, with the second unit. But of course, this season, the last few games, both of you guys are finally finding a little bit over there. What do you think? What's changed? Nothing. Nothing's changed. We're still, everybody's in attack mode. Um, you know, Kelly's been great. Uh, but, you know, now we're making shots. We're, we're starting to get it together on the defensive end. So, uh, I mean, we're still playing the same way. We're just, things are starting to just fall in place for us. Uh, it gives us a lot of confidence, um, you know, defending home court. <clears throat> but, you know, we can't 
dwell too much on, you know, these two wins. We still have a lot of work to do. Uh, we still have to get better in some areas. Uh, watch film tomorrow. You know, see what we can continue to get better at, what we can work on, and uh, go from there. But, um, you know, it does feel good to start uh, getting some wins, wins under our belt. Uh, but you got to continue to do great things on the defensive end. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Focus TV. It's another week. I tell you, you're going to make it through. You're going to make it through this show. You can do it. You know, just woo side. You know, and you just find your center and just get through it. But uh, it's going to be a long <laughs> show for you. I got 52 more minutes. Oh, no, we counting? <laughs> wow. Technically, like, less because the video was kicked off the oh, show. Oh, gosh. It's so, like I'm joking. <laughs> you know what? I was going to be quiet during this segment. I'm I'm want to be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's not an option there. All right, as you guys saw from how we started off the show, um, Brad Bill, Jeff Green speaking after last night's win over the Orlando Magic. It was a much needed win for the Wizards. Also, something you know, the first time this year, they won back to back games. Uh, they beat the Magic last night to kick off a five game homestead, 117, 109. It was a back and forth affair for nearly three quarters. Uh, heading into the, at the end of three, I believe it was 83, 83. Jeff Green and John Wall combined to score 19 points in the fourth quarter. Wall finished with 25 and 10. Uh, that's assist that is in a really big block down the stretch of Evan Fournier. Jeff Green continued his recent stretch against play, scored 18 points, going down six, six rebounds. But most importantly, um, as Cardell cited while we were watching the game last night, which is uh, the Wizards found something against Orlando's defense, right? Mm -hmm. So Jeff closed the game out, technically playing the five. So they're running that pick and roll with Jeff as a screener, and Orlando just didn't have an answer. A couple times it left Jeff open for wide open threes. I believe he started the game like five for five, so he was already hot. Um, then, you know, you step up, you want to try to take Jeff away. You let John get downhill, which I, that's probably not a good thing anyways. So he's getting downhill, drawing fouls. Um, so he was kind of in his thing last night. Hit a nice little one-legged fadeaway on Vucevic. But uh, one thing we're starting to see more and more Different, uh, Jeff and John, they got this nice chemistry going. Uh, when those two are in the screen roll, uh, Jeff threw down another monstrous dunk off a good lob pass from John. Uh, a couple things that stood out. Oh, obviously, be remiss, don't mention Terrence Ross for Orlando. He started the game hot. He stayed hot. He ended the game hot. Evan Fournier chipped in with 20 points. Um, but the biggest thing, the rebounds on... I want to say Saturday night in Miami. That was the first time all year the Wizards won the Battle of the Boards. Last night, that was the second time the Wizards won the Battle on the Boards. So in both of those games, they won. So that's kind of a good barometer just to see what's going on with that team each and every night. Check the glass. Um, also with the bench, a lot, of, a lot had been said about the slow start to the season for the bench. Um, past couple games, it seems like Jeff and Austin are starting to find their comfort level on this new team. And, I mean, as we expected, some things just take time when you have people trying to figure out what they can and can't do within the realm of a new team. Um, so, you know, that's getting there. I'm not saying everything's fixed. Trust me, they got a long way to go. But, uh, Wall, <laughs> taking some shots nationally, um, some of them deserved uh, for his play and, uh, and other things that may have led to poor play. But... Last two games, um, credit to him for um, he's taken, he's accepted a responsibility, um, especially defensively. It's been a different Wizards team defensively. Um, the last two games, he was he didn't allow himself to be screened. He was a pest. He was feisty, looked light on his feet. It was just a, it was a good showing for him. And I really like the floor game he played. Um, you and I had talk, we saw him at times kind of do a little too much. It's, it, it doesn't really work for this team. He needs to be the guy creating for other folks. and. He did uh, find a nice, he walked the fine line last night. So Cardell, last night's game, just your thoughts on it and what it means going forward because they got four more games at home, you know, within the, uh, within the next week and a half or whatnot to kind of try to help them get closer to 500. It's like what Scott Brooks said, you know, they got to start with defense, come in with a defensive mentality. Um, you know, 
a, a lot of times in, in pro, across all the pro sports, you'll see the top team. A lot of teams try to mimic the top team who have won the championship, try to duplicate what they did. But, you know, that's dumb to do because you don't have the personnel to do it. So you got to stick to what works for you and hope that's enough to try to win more games than not. And, you know, they came out early this season. Mostly you could just tell they was all just – it was mostly offense and defense was secondary. A lot of guys trying to establish roles and stuff like that. And, you know, you saw the results. And they got embarrassed. And like you said last week, it got to a point where national folks calling out, you know, not just the team, but, you know, the star of the team, John Wall, you know, talking about it's all core cool activities, having that, you know, is the main reason for that. And the one thing I always like about, like about Wall is, you know, he'll fight a little bit. You know, he, you know, everybody a little stubborn, so to speak. But he eventually calmed down and recognized that that's the truth. And you can see his play has picked up since then dramatically. Even in Orlando, I mean, when they lost Orlando on Friday, I think that was a tipping point because down the stretch, he was pressing. He was yeah. trying to score. And he took some bad shots that weren't even close to going in. And I think the last one where he fell, Man, the teammates just turned their back and walked to the bench. That's telling, you know. And I think that's when he kind of just looked in the mirror, you know, and said, you know what, let me let me slow down. He's better when he's slowing down. And I don't understand why a lot of players don't figure that out. You don't always have to force the issue, especially with the talent around them this year. Mm -hmm. You know, just set the table and everything, and you'll get yours within the flow. And that's what we've been seeing the past two games. You know, the one thing I love, one play that always stand out to me, Bill was struggling last night. Yeah. But with, the, with them and the Magic basically even, Wall stepped out. He got the pass. He had a wide open three. You know what he did? He paused. He waited till the man ran out at him, and he found Bill curling because he he recognized I got to get Bill going so we could finish this game and get him in rhythm, which would make it easier for me and everybody else. Bill knocked down the shot, and that's what got Bill going. Those are things as a point guard and as a leader you have to look at and try to do night in, night out. And then obviously um, with, Jeff, with Jeff Green doing what he's doing, he was 100% from the field, like, Going into the fourth quarter, he was killing. You know, Scott Brooks, shout out to him. He, he did an excellent coaching job with that move. Oh, we're going to run pick and roll with Jeff and Wall. So don't think the Magic ain't recognize that Jeff was hot. So it's just like, what you going to, hey, pick your poison. And they had no answer. And they mainly targeted Vucevic because he's not, you know, ideal defender out on yeah. the perimeter. And he, he just stuck like, man, I'm just trying to go guard both of them. That's when the lobs came. That's when John Wall got layups. That's when he hit the three, Jeff Green hit the three point. That's when Wall hit the mid range. And that was all she wrote. You know, he's, he's better when he's playing at a pace that fits him and not trying to, you know, go back at other point guards, trying to be Steph and all that. Just let the game come to him, and he's always better. Because over the last two games, he's averaging 26 and a half points, nine and a half assists, three rebounds on 51% shooting from the field and 62% shooting from deep on, and only two and a half turnovers. If he can keep that production up for the rest of the season, the Wizards going to be right there at the end. Yeah, and I love the, you know, sitting next to each other last night. The first thing you, you turned with that, that shovel pass to Bill. Yeah. He was he was really searching for a shot, and it happened in that third quarter. Bill, is, uh, he had nine points in that quarter. And that helped because when they were running that pick and roll later, because Bill started, come, Bill started to find his rhythm. Couldn't dig down. You couldn't. couldn't you, exactly. Bill's man couldn't leave. And you know, John, if you leave, a, you leave somebody in the corner. I don't care where, where he is or you are. He's going to find that person. So since you can't help, that just left John and Jeff to just destroy Vucevic on that, you know, on that screen roll. So. And, and one other thing, that the defense is approving. Yeah. I think five of the last eight quarters, basically five of the you know, you know, last two games, they held teams under 30 points in a quarter, which obviously this season is great. Well, yeah, with the scores going up, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and definitely for the Wizards, man. They was getting them like 30, 40 in a quarter, like – yeah, all day, man. It was crazy. So, um, but one thing they haven't, a lot of people not realizing that their Achilles heel have been rebounding. Mm -hmm. That's the thing that closes out defense. Yep. But on ball, rotating, they've been good enough to win games because they've been active. I don't think a lot of people realize that they rank fifth in the league in blocks. Remember, Dwight just came back. So, they've been consistently up there in blocks. So, that's the guards and Uber and the wings swarming and stuff. But then they rank 13th in steals at 8.1. So they're active, they're getting tip ball, especially Oubre and Wall, they, they, they're all over the place. And even Bill, Bill stepped it up defensively. Yeah. You got to give him credit. You know, a lot of people saying he was on, he's just a one-side ball player. Now he, you got to say he, he's impacting both ends and rebounding. Like he, he's yeah, taking it, per, yeah, like last night he had eight. Yeah. So he getting down there doing what he got to do. You know, the Wizards, I like what, they're starting to figure it out. And maybe it took that 
that embarrassment last week for them to be like, man, we get, we got to buckle down because that, that's not cool if you got any pride whatsoever. So um, if they keep up the defensive intensity, and obviously it starts with Wall, Wall play within himself, you know, they, went, they, they get back on track. All right, before we uh, head to break, because um, we got a lot more coming, uh, real quick update on the go-go. They played Sunday. They fell to the Rio Grande Vipers. That's Houston's G League team. No matter what, you know, just pretty much it was just tough. You know, when you're not shooting the ball well and you're not getting stops, it, it's hard for anybody to win. Uh, a familiar name to Wizards fans, Daniel House. Uh, Daniel House. I mean, every time the Capital City tried to get back into the game, he seemed like it was his personal <laughs> goal. <laughs> his personal goal in life, at least that Sunday afternoon, to erase every single run. He finished the game with 33 points, knocked down six of his 11 threes, which is huge because if you know the knock on him, he's not a big time, he's not known to be a big time shooter. But again, he knocked down six of his 11 attempts. He got to the line 12 times. Um, and the biggest thing for Capital City, you know, they play, their starting lineup uh, features three guards, it's a three guard lineup. The Vipers got a bit more size and they switch everything, just like their parent team does. <laughs> well, their parent team used to, sorry. They switch everything. Sorry, Octavia. They switch, they switch everything, and it really bothered Capital City. Um, but head over to FindersMag.com, MyModelSports.com as well. Uh, check out what Coach Darrell Christian had to say and uh, recap. And, you know, follow both sites, and we'll keep you guys updated on both the Wizards and the Go-Go Against. Go ahead. One update before we kind of get away sure. from the NBA for a while. Uh, Dream My Green has been suspended by the Warriors yeah. from one game. Without um, pay. Yeah. Yeah, that's – I love that because <laughs> he was tripping last night. Mm -hmm. he, he really cost them the game with that, and that's an example, but that's why they're the champs. They, they made everybody held accountable. You know, like, you know, you won't see what happened in Minnesota happen with them. So. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because Twitter's having a field day with it, but if you wind it back like two years ago, with you know, Kevin. when he got in. When they get Kevin. Uh, not when he got into it with Kerr, when Dre got mm -hmm. into it with Kerr. And it's just like, like you said, if you're holding everybody accountable, Sometimes you get out of line, you gotta be held in check too. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna join with all the conspiracy theorists of, oh, it's over, break up Golden State, it's finally crumbling. Nah, it's just, <laughs> Draymond's Draymond. And when you got somebody that, that walks that line that much, or you know, walks over that line on a regular basis, um, for the good and the bad, this is one of the time where it's for the bad, he was wrong. You gotta it, it's really simple, and I think, I will give Draymond this. Even the times when he's caught tripping, you give him time, he knows he did wrong. Mm -hmm. He knows what it was because it, it just wasn't right. But um, we're going to head to break, and we've come back. We got a whole new segment. So it's college basketball season. You know, we got we to fill this time up with something, guys. So we're going to fill that up. We got some stuff to talk about between Cardinal and I, cover some teams, some uh, collegiate teams in the area. We got a good matchup tomorrow night, GW Maryland. Looking forward to that. But you're watching the Focus TV, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Focus TV. As promised, our new segment is college basketball. So I'm going to start over with Maryland. Um, the Terps played two games in three days over this past weekend. They opened a regular season campaign with a 93-36 win over visiting Coppin State. Uh, some things that stood out, the defense, they're not there yet. All right, They were solid, but they're just not there yet. 
they do have the ability with the personnel they have to play uh, to be a good team, both um, in man-to-man -man defense and zone. But, uh, you know, they're just not there yet. Still a little bit disjointed. Uh, they surrendered 13 offensive rebounds, and that was literally just from something as simple as just not boxing out. It was small things. Turnovers. There were times where I guess I should have maybe said sloppy play because there were times where the bad play or the bad decision didn't lead to turnovers, but it's stuff that needs to be cleaned up. Again, this was just the first game of someone's regular season campaign. Stuff's not going to be perfect. Uh, someone who jumped out. Taylor Mikesell, confident, assertive. Um, it's the type of guard you definitely want to have on your team. She took 11 shots in the first half as a freshman. Um, she knocked down five of them. She continued to be confident in the second half. She finished the game with 14 attempts, 10 of which came, to, came from beyond the arc. Another freshman, uh, Shakira Austin, she made her present felt. She had 21 rebounds, I believe it was seven blocks. She was everywhere. She obviously needs to, you know, she's a freshman. She needs to put some more muscle on, and that'll happen in time. But she, she patrols the paint. It gives Maryland a different type of big that they've had um, for a little bit. And she has a mean streak to her. So that, that's something pleasant down there. See someone who, even though, you know, she doesn't ha yet have the strength to do everything she would like to do down there, she's not rocking down there. Like, that's her paint, and she's going to protect it. Also, Shanice Lewis. Uh, talked about John having a good floor game. Got to compliment this young lady as well. It wasn't something in terms of having 12, 13 assists, but she she ran the show well. Uh, the team moved the ball efficiently, and she finished the game with eight points and three assists, and she didn't turn the ball over once. Again, you have a clean floor game without having a double-double. The other thing was one of the biggest differences from last year at times, she was, she, wasn't, she was very passive. She wasn't assertive at times when she needed to be. Um, she has the ability to get put her head down, attack off the bounce, get to the basket, and she didn't do as much last year. She did it a few times in that game. On Sunday, they hosted Dayton. Kyle Charles scored 22 points. Taylor Mikesell had 15. And, you know, uh, Maryland was able to win 82-71. Blair Watson and Shakira Austin also had 14 points apiece for the Terps. And Stephanie Jones added 11. So, Gardell, the floor is yours, sir. I was at a couple games last week. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with GW. Okay. Uh, GW Mans. I was at the Siena game. They obviously fell late to them, 69-61. Um, then they traveled to UVA to take on now fourth rank Virginia, and they uh, were blown out by them, 76-57, to fall on 0-3 on the season. Uh, they faced uh, number 18 Michigan Saturday at noon. Yes. Um, they're young. You know, outside of the Virginia game, their first two games, they could easily won, so they could easily be two and one. I know people panic and just overhype things, but they're close. But they're young and they have a brand, pretty much a brand new team. I mean, obviously, like Terry Nolan is there and Arnaldo Toro, guys like that in Missoula, who are, who's another sophomore that just came on the scene. But you know, for the most part, they're very young and they're trying to figure not just college basketball in a sense. They're trying to figure themselves out what they can do, and that's the adjustment right now. And obviously, uh, you know. College basketball is unforgiving. They're not going to wait on you to figure it out. They're going to get at you because in the first game against Stony Brook, they, they jumped out with a 22 nothing lead. But Stony Brook walked them down. Against Siena, they tied it up late, 55. But Stony Brook, I mean, but Siena managed to pull out late. Their Achilles heel is somewhat similar to what's going on with the Wizards. They can't make free throws, and they're not a good rebounding team. Um, that's That's... I mean, right now, they're every, going in every game, GW's at a minus 8.3 average rebound-wise. You're not going to win a lot of games like that, especially with a team where they're so young. You don't know outside of, like, Nolan and Missoula. You, you don't quite know. And DJ Williams, who's just came back, you don't quite know where the offense is going to come from. And from the free throw line, as a team, they're shooting 54%. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, it's hard to close games. Even if you jump out, you're going to cool off. Those are the games where you got to be able to hit free throws down the stretch. To close things out and teams see that. Um, my, I'm just waiting for them to try to correct those issues, and then I, I could really see what it is because those are, I, 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 they've never been that bad of a free throw shooting team. I can't imagine that this will continue uh, throughout the season. You know, obviously, so on auto turtles, they lead in rebound. He averages, he almost having a double double with nine points and 9.3 rebounds, but you know, he need more help down there because at, at times against Siena, 
he was like the only big. And so, similar to the Wizards, the guards going to have to go down there and rebound more to try to help close that gap. And the thing that killed him was Sienna. Even though they gave up so many offensive rebounds, Sienna wasn't just giving putbacks. They were giving back, back wide over threes. Like, their bigs like to step out and hit threes. That's what won the game. So, when they got burned on the offensive rebound, everybody underneath the basket scrambling, just passed it out. They sitting out there hitting the three. And that's what pretty much took them out. Um, I like their improvement with Terry Nolan Jr., who I feel has the potential to be one of the best two-way players in the A-time. Um, you know, he, he's increased his average average 13 points, five rebounds. Uh, on 40% shooting from the field, that will improve, but 44 from, from deep. So you have to guard him out there, which last year he, they pretty much just saved off him there to shoot. So now you have to guard him, you know, straight up. He got to improve his free throw shooting. He's one of the main culprits in that area. He's only shooting 45% right now. That has to improve, especially with his explosiveness to get in the room, get to the um, basket and draw so many fouls. He got to be able to knock those shots down. Like he, if he get that up to about 70%, 80%, he could possibly win games by himself, you know, trying to close games out. Uh, a, a great surprise is Justin Mazzula, you know, who's basically running point guard duties. He, he all over the place, you know. I, Mo, you could just see Mo just having him all over the place, playing three different positions. Uh, he's averaging 10 points, five rebounds, but he's efficient with it. 48% from the field, 42% from from deep. Um, I like what he's bringing. One thing I want to see him do is try to get the other players going more. I think he can get his, uh, but I want him to see him try to instill confidence in other guys so they can get going, get them easy points because that's how they will come out this hole, this old three hole, and try to make some noise later on, especially doing, you know, when conference season start. And, uh, you know, like I said, I mentioned Toro, nine points, 9.3 rebounds. I like to see him get more touches inside. He can finish well. And he can also draw, you know, uh, fouls and get to the free throw line. If he can get his average up about 13, 15, teams will have to account for him. That's when the doubles come. And I think he's an underrated passer. And like I said, you got two dudes shooting in the mid-40s right now from deep. Exactly. So, you know, you got to balance it out. But like I said, they start, they're trying to figure themselves out. And DJ Williams, who's the transfer, uh, I, I think, out of Illinois, um, he's averaging 12 and a half points and four rebounds. Just a second game back. He's trying to find his rhythm, but I think he's going to be huge for them as well because he's one of the few that got big game experience, obviously. And, you know, if he can get, if they can get it together and just figure out their roles and just play, play within themselves, similar to the Wizards, they'll win their fair share of games and they'll be a much different team. Because you know how college basketball is, the teams that a lot of, you know, you see a lot of teams how they are now, it's not going to be how they are down the road. Yeah. So it's dangerous to kind of jump, you know, get too high, get too low right now. Uh, another game I went to that was pretty exciting was Howard. You know, they took on NAIA Power Washington at Venice. You know, out of Tacoma Park, people need to go check them out. They're always right there in the mix for trying to get to the national uh, tournament, trying to compete for national championships. And a lot of people don't even know because they, you know, you know, stereotype NAIA, why? Especially with all the powerhouse programs around here. But you need to check them out. You know, Pratchett Curry doing a great job over there, man. He, year in, year out, he pumping players out there. They're developing and they're getting it done on the court. Um, Howard, you know, led by Redshirt Junior Guard Chad Lott, definitely need to keep an eye on him. He's dangerous. He, he's lethal. With a, you know, he finished with a game high 27 points, eight rebounds, four assists, so 10 or 15 shooting. Uh, led by him, Howard defeated Washington Venice 115 91. Uh, he was also joined by all MEAC sophomore point guard RJ Cole, who was in foul trouble for most of the first half, came back and only, in only 22 minutes had 22 points and eight assists. Thanks. Uh, he's one of the, I, mean, I say, he's one of the best point guards in the, in the college of basketball, period. I don't care what nobody said. He, he, he was the that's best. A, that's a, a lot. Yeah, he's from Jersey, and a lot of people miss him because he's, he's lethal, and he, he goes to work, and that's light. And um, I saw him last year when they played at GW, and that's when he caught my eye. He, he was giving GW all they could handle, and I'm like, man, who, who is this? Like, nobody could guard him as a freshman. Do you know the reason, one of the reasons that he just got overlooked? Is it small stature or something, or he got good size? You no, know, I mean, they overlooked him because uh, he came from St. Anthony, Bob Hurley. He's small. He's only six feet, but he could play. It's just one of them things where yeah. people just – overthink things yeah. um, and I like the fact that he kind of he's one of the few that you know I'm gonna make my own path you know I'm gonna go to Howard I'm gonna do my thing mm. obviously you know the academic side of Howard benefits that we have so he's he's more so both sides of it and, and that's what I love about him but he can hoop with the best of them um, he's, he's like I said he's one of the best in the country I just did me at you know, that's light work for him he, he can rumble with the high majors whoever you want he, he can go to war with them 
And they did this damage without all me at shooting guard Charles Williams, who's a 6'6 high flying wing. He sat out with injury. Uh, Washington Venice was led by senior guard Charles Vines. He finished with 18 points. Uh, junior forward Terrence Mayimba, who was a former George Mason signee, he finished with 18 points and seven rebounds. And uh, freshman point guard Shaheen Gilkerson, who finished with 15 points, eight rebounds, and four assists. Keep an eye on Shaheen just to be a freshman going toe to toe with RJ Cole. That he 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 got what it takes. He's just a jumper away. If he can hit jumpers, he's a total package. He's going to dominate the NAIA. So he 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 wasn't he wasn't scared in the moment. He went at him. He defended him. Uh, and actually, he was the one that got cold and fouled trouble because he look he ain't wasting no time. He got the outlet pass. Yeah. He saw a scene to get to the basket. He went right at him. And that, and all Cole could do was just foul. Him. I think he you know he didn't under, he underestimated his speed and quickness. Right. So, but when he came back in, he went to work. He's like you mm-hmm. know it's, it's just one of those things. So. Uh, keep an eye on Washington and Venice. Uh, they hung with Howard for most of part for the first half, and uh, you know with R.J. Cole and Foul Show, but Lot did his thing, so they couldn't quite get over the hump and take the lead. And then R.J. Cole came in and did what he did. But keep a, keep an eye on them, and then I, I think they're going to do a lot of damage. All right, as uh, as we told you a little bit earlier, both going to be in uh, at GW at the Smith Center yep. tomorrow night for Maryland GW. So. We'll have that for you guys. Both women, women. So y'all don't. I'm know so this. sorry. Thank you for clarifying. Um, gonna be a good woman, a local woman's matchup tomorrow night. Um, go over to findersmag.com, mymodelsports.com as well. Uh, this week for that type of country coverage, I can't talk. So y'all gotta just help me get through this. Uh, Nine four fifty breakdown. Jamal Hayward. Mm-hmm. This week's a fade option off a pro hop. Again, a fade option off a pro hop. Check this out. We're going to take a quick break. We'll see you on the other side for Octavia's NFC East segment. <laughs> oh, boy, I can't wait to talk about it. Oh, boy. We're doing a breakdown of the pro hop and a different finish with the pro hop. So I'm going to show you how you're supposed to do it on the high school level, the college level, as well as the pro level. So I'm going to go right, one two, three, two, pro hop. For high school, you have to land on two. College, you have to land on two. On the pro level, you can land one, two. So once I land here, there's a big, it's helping, I stay back, okay? Same thing if I go left. One, high school level, pro level. Stay back. So now, here it is, hand speed. The biggest thing you're going for a layup, but you fade back, you have to shoot the shot with a lot of heart. We're doing a breakdown of the pro hop and a different finish with the pro hop. So I'm going to show you how you're supposed to do it on the high school level, the college level, as well as the pro level. So I'm going to go right, one two, three, two, pro hop. For high school, you have to land on two. College, you have to land on two. On the pro level, you can land one two. So once I land here, it's helping, I stay back, okay? Same thing if I go left. One, high school level, pro level. Stay back. So now, here it is, game speed. The biggest thing you're going for a layup, but you fade back, you have to shoot the shot with a lot of heart. Welcome back again. Shout out to Jamal Hayward. Thank you so much. Um, definitely enjoy that installment each and every week. Hope you guys enjoy it as much as Travis does, because Travis loves it. Um, so hopefully there's something outside of Travis that watches it each and every week. Um, Octavia, so what happened in your division this week? Oh, so I know much. one of the games, actually I know two of the games that happened. Oh, one of them so brings much. me joy, one of them did not. So. Uh, yeah. Oh, so much. Um, this week I decided to start with the only scene in the NFC East that lost. <laughs> my Philadelphia Eagles. So, um, <laughs> huh? What you say? Louder. <laughs> my, I, I think we heard my. Go ahead. Yeah, we can't hear you. My Philadelphia Eagles. Oh, no, no, no. I can hear you. So, yes, my Philadelphia Eagles lost to the Cowboys this week. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> score was 27 to 20. The Cowboys are now 4 and 5, 2 and 1 in the division. The Eagles are also 4 and 5, but 1 and 1 in the division. Like I said, the Cowboys won 27, Eagles 20. Cowboys' next game is going to be against the Falcons. 
And then, of course, our next game is against the Saints. So, <laughs> so excited about this. Yeah, I should not be. Um, so, Dak Prescott was 26 of 36, 270 yards, one touchdown, six carries, nine yards, and one touchdown. Ezekiel Elliott, 19 carries, 151 yards, one touchdown, six receptions, 36 yards, and one touchdown. And Amari Cooper has six receptions for 75 yards. Carson Wentz, 32 of 44, two touchdowns, one interception, two carries for seven yards. Josh Adams, seven carries for 47 yards. And Zach Ertz had 14 receptions, 145 yards, and two touchdowns. Nelson Aguilar, five receptions, 83 yards. So I wish I could forget this game ever happened, but obviously I can't. Um, Hats off goes to the Cowboys. You know, a lot of people thought that after the thrashing that they had against the Titans that it was going to be a hard road back for them, especially with their upcoming season, um, upcoming games on the season. But they actually turned it around really well. Um, the one thing that I think that they need to stay with each game is continuously give Zeke the ball. Like, he says it all the time, feed me, feed me, all of that. I just feel like they have a better chance at winning games when the – when it runs through him, I just that's just what I look. Um, he's able to do it everywhere, and as you can see, you know, 151 yards rushing, 36 yards receiving, and a rushing touchdown and a receiving touchdown. You know, you can't really beat that. The defense was just bad. It was just bad on our side. It was just bad. It was just everything was bad. Um, you know. This was one particular game. Dak didn't throw an t- interception, so that was good on their end. You know, they kept it together there. I'm sorry, you didn't see the picture that we're seeing right now. I don't want to see it. That's okay. Oh, let me show you. Oh, nope, that's okay. Yeah, don't want to see it. And, um, <laughs> you know, it, player, with everything that's going on with the Eagles as now, you know, to me, Wentz is still showing that he's in good form. He's coming back really well off of the injury. You know, it's just – Everything is just still not clicking. I still think the biggest issue really is that we don't have a running game. Like I said, the leading runner had 47 yards, seven carries, Josh Adams. Uh, Darren Sproles was initially supposed to play this week, but then re-aggravated that same hamstring, which has him out for another couple of weeks. Um, I'm pretty sure they already said that this was his last season. It's not looking too good. And then you think who is up next. Like I said, you still have Wendell Smallwood, Corey Clement, who's barely getting any touches as it is now, and Josh Adams. Um, Although we did get Golden Tate, he wasn't really that involved in the offense this week. Um, At this point, you know, with all the receptions, so I said Zach had 14 receptions, Nelson Aguilar had five receptions, uh, Alshon Jeffrey, I believe, had five receptions. So the wide receivers are are trying to compensate for a, a lack of a running game. Um, and it's, I don't know if it's going to work out for the whole season. It doesn't look like it right now. Right now, I'm over football. I'm, already, <laughs> I'm announcing this tonight. I am over football. I am ready for next year. So whatever happens at the, <laughs> the rest of this year, it happens. So like I said, um, more touches for Zeke is, to me, equals a success for the Cowboys. Like if the Cowboys play the Falcons next week, who is coming off of a loss to the Browns, so you expect them to be fired up after losing to the Browns. So that should be a good game as well. Eagles play the Saints, um, who did sign Des Bryant last week, who turned around and tore his Achilles the next day in the first practice. And he's now out for the remaining of the season. I believe they said it's an eight-month rehab. So, but they did also sign Brandon Marshall, the Saints did. Um, so I'm sure they'll be working him in this week. And we will see what happens next week with that game. On to the next, we have the Giants who played the 49ers. The Giants are now 2-7, and 0-3 oh in the division. The Giants did defeat the 49ers 27-23. Their next game is going to be against the Bucks. Eli Manning was 19-31, of 31, 188 yards and three touchdowns. Saquon Barkley, 20 carries, 67 yards, four receptions, 33 yards. Odell Beckham, four receptions for 73 yards and two touchdowns. And Sterling Shepard, two receptions, nine yards, one touchdown. Um, I always say you can tell when the Giants do well, it, it all centers around their offensive line. The offensive line actually gave Eli time this week, and you saw glimpses and flashes of the old Eli. When he has time to adequately you know, scan the field and get the ball to the open player, he's able to do so. Uh, although Odell missed the very first pass that he did throw to him, you know, after that he stepped it up. He had those two clutch touchdowns. Their defense stood up for them as well. Um, was able to get a a great turnover, so that way they were able to put them in great field position for a touchdown. 
And you see the difference in the red zone this week with them. Usually in the red zones, they're not scoring points, but when they got down there, they were actually able to score this week. Eli throwing three touchdowns. You know, a lot of people were already saying previously to this week that this could have been his last starting um, position this year. But as we all know, backup quarterback to him was arrested. And more than likely, they probably won't have him play, especially if Eli continues to play well. They do have another good shot this week going up against the Bucks. Uh, right now, Odell is saying that he wants to end the season 9-7. and seven. They got one game down, eight more to go. And the Bucks is not a, a hard feat for them, so they should be able to if things continue to work out like they were this week. This was the first time the Giants won a game in 50 days. So that tells you a lot. It's been a while. Although Saquon Barkley did not score this week, which is kind of an anomaly with the Giants winning and Saquon not scoring as opposed to he scores and they don't win. And I do remember they saying that one of the biggest things that he's trying to adjust to this year is the non-winning. He's used to winning and being able to produce for the team and it turn into W. So him being a rookie, still trying to get that under his belt and still be able to play. I, can, I commend him for that. And right now, like I said, they play the Bucks next week, who, as we go into the next game, played the Redskins this week. The Redskins are now 6-3, and 2-0 two and on the division. They're not, they did play the Bucks. They won 16-3. Their next game is against the Texans. So Alex Smith was 19 of 27, 178 yards, two carries, 16 yards. Adrian Peterson, 19 carries for 68 yards. Maurice Harris had five receptions for 52 yards, and Josh Doxton had four receptions, 46 yards, and one touchdown. With a lot of key players missing for the Redskins, especially on their offensive line, I do like the way that they were able to hold it together. You can, you know, some people call it a patchwork offensive line or whatever you want to call it. They were able to hold it together, you know, to protect Alex as much as they possibly could. Um, the defense who are creating turnovers, at least one turn of every game, uh, each game back to back, you know, Josh Norman had a great interception where he was able to take the ball away from the Bucks um, on an interception pass by Fitzpatrick. Although a lot of people will say that the Bucks really beat themselves in this game, the Redskins capitalized on a lot of things that you know would have gone in the Bucks' favor had they done what they were supposed to do, and that's what you're supposed to do. A win is a win, regardless of how you look at it. You know, 16 to three with one touchdown. Alex Smith didn't throw a touchdown. Um, it was a, you know, all around kind of gritty game. A lot of people were watching it, um, trying to figure out which way it was going to go because it was really up in the air for most of the game. I believe it was 6-3 to three at halftime. Um, excuse me. So um, this is the first time the Redskins have been 6-3 and three since 2008. Um, I think they have a great chance to go on and, you know, they could possibly go ahead and win out in the division. I don't know how it's going to go from there. There's a lot of things that's going to happen once you get outside of the division because there are a lot of great teams in the NFC. But they actually have a really good, you know, shot this year. And I'm saying that, <laughs> and it is recorded. So, so it's, actually, on wax. <laughs> it's on wax. I said it. They have an actually really good chance. This is, you know, the best that they, in my opinion, the best that I've seen them play in a long time. And, you know, although, that, like I said, the game wasn't a, a pretty win, they do still have some things they have to work on. You know, 16 points isn't going to get it going through the rest of the year, and they're going to have to be able to produce and be able to score, um, especially with, you know, Adrian Peterson doing as well as he has been doing, although he didn't do great this game. It was enough for them to win the game, and that's all that really counts. So they play the Texans next week, um, who I believe are coming off of a bye. They picked up uh, Namaris Thomas. You know, they still got Watson as a quarterback, De DeAndre Hopkins. They have a lot going on over there as well, so it should be a good game. And it, it's going to be a game that the Redskins really need to win, in my opinion, just to separate them even further from the pack in the NFC East right now. Like I said, they're first. The Cowboys are now second. Redskins are, um, the Eagles are third. Giants are fourth. Although the Cowboys and the Eagles have the same record, they have one more. the Cowboys have one more divisional win than the, the um, Eagles. So they all obviously would be second. They're still... As Damo told me before we got here, because I've been over it since <laughs> Sunday, um, there's still a lot of games left in the season. You know, there's still a lot of things that can happen, but I really do think the Redskins have a good chance of getting out. Um, I, I'm kind of over my team at this point. We'll see what happens. But there's a lot of things going on in the NFC, uh, in, the, in the NFL period. A um, couple quick notable things, I guess. Uh, well, I'm not going to get into it, because I'm pretty sure it's in rapid fire, so I'll hold it. 
All right, well, since you say way to rapid fire already, <laughs> Carter, I appreciate, it. Hey, look, I appreciate that too. I tell you, I'm good. <laughs> well, we're going to start with college basketball. Mm. Uh, rankings came out. Is Duke deserving of being the top team in the country right now? Absolutely. Is that a serious question? Yeah. It was kind of, I was, mm. when I first watched the game, and, you know, because I don't really pay attention to the seed mm. until the season starts, I was like, Duke was fourth? Oh, okay, and then Kentucky was two, and then they went out there and just did what they did, and it was kind of hard to watch if you're not a Duke fan. <laughs> if you're a Duke fan, I'm sure you loved it. Look, but um, I definitely think they're deserving. I'm not a Duke fan. This is against everything <laughs> in my fiber. But I tuned in to watch to see what was what because I wanted to see with my own eyes before I felt any type of way. And all I can say is if anybody has an issue where them dudes are ranked, that's your own personal problem. <laughs> tell them to meet um, me at the courts. <laughs> see what happens then. Just tell somebody to stop something over there. Um, it's deserving and, you know, barring, you know, some unforeseen circumstance, look, man, they should stay right there for the rain of the year. Go ahead, Cardo. I mean, I'm not mad at it. You know, I know Kansas was number one. They had an impressive win over Michigan State mm -hmm. right before Duke um, destroyed Kentucky. So I'm not. I'm not mad at it. it, it it's either them or Kansas mm -hmm. um, for right now. But, uh, you know, I mean, the reason why they were ranked four because once you get past the freshman, no one knows who, who anybody else is on the team. <laughs> you can't name one Dookie, and that's not normal. But that just tell you the impact of the freshman. Um, you know, Barrett came in number one, ranked player. Zion was in, you know, top five. Man. Cam Reddish was too. You know, Trey Young, top 15. And, uh, they just going to work, man. You know, I mean, and, and it's not just what they did in Kentucky because, you know, I'm, Kentucky were kids. They were, led by, yeah. they were led by freshmen, too. But their freshmen outside of Kelvin and Johnson are not quite at the level mm -hmm. of Duke's freshmen. So that's why they got punished. Yep. But Army was different because you was dealing with grown men. Yep. They know how to play. And I, I walked away from the game like, Army's good. You know, like, they're they real good. They're going to they gonna do a lot of damage this year because they gave them all they can handle. But... Zion, man. They're going to do no with Zion, man. <laughs> like, when Barrett was struggling and Cameron Reddish, he started off a little slow, then he started knocking a couple of threes down. All that was off of what Zion was doing. And I hear a lot of people saying, you know, Zion, they, they, they just hating. You know, it seemed to be in a lot of people's nature. They can't just get props where it's due, man. It's, he ain't skilled and all that. I'm like, look at it, man. That ball handling is a skill. Passing is a skill. Defense is a skill. Rebounding is a skill. Playing efficient basketball is a skill. You know, I saw him, I've seen him shoot a couple mid-range jumpers. ain't hit the rim yet. So, I don't understand why y'all can't see what he's skilled. He, he, his game complements what he has naturally in his athletic ability. And that's what it's supposed and to be. So, to label him just an athlete is disrespectful. Because athletes ain't going to just come in as a true freshman averaging 27.5 points and 11.5 rebounds on 81% shooting from the field. Yeah, no. And, and, and I'm leading the team with seven blocks. You see what I'm saying? Like, it, it just don't happen. He's all over the place. And the thing I like about him, he's he can defend all five posi yeah. possessions because he's quick. But he got a motor, man. Like, he plays hard. Like, he was the one on the ground getting all the loose balls and fighting and everything like that. Like, like you don't see that, especially from heralded players. They – not nah, bench warms do that. <laughs> so, I love that. Bear the dog, too. You know, he got out to a slow start, but he warmed up and got it going. You know, he averaged 28 leading the team, or not, five rebounds, 49% uh, from the field, 37% from three. And Cameron Reddish is their best three-point shooter. Uh, he, I mean, 47% from deep. Like, he, he's – look, you can't leave him. And uh, averaging 23 and a half or four and a half rebounds. So, they're getting it done. But the unsung player is Trey Jones. I mean, I was watching him on the circuit. He was a scorer. Like, his brother Tyus was more of a playmaker all, all day. He was more of a scorer, but obviously I could see for this thing to work, he, he kind of doing the Draymond thing. I got sacrificed so we can make this thing work because we can't just have four players jacking, mm -hmm. especially when I'm the point guard. I got the ball in my hands. He's setting the table. They eating. It's flowing. I mean, props to them, man. They, you know, they well deserving of it. Uh, as you say, we get right into it. Uh, Le'Veon Bell, will he regret not reporting by the deadline? At this point, I don't think so. I think I think I think at this point, eight nine weeks into the season, he's already come to terms with it. In my opinion, he should have at this point. Mm -hmm. at, the, at this at this point, there's no turning back. I feel like he had to have think about thought about these things before the season started, and knew either this is what it was going to be that you're going to sign another franchise tag or you're not playing this year. 
And I think that that time out in Miami or whatever he was doing, he was probably still contemplating going back and forth. But now that it's actually here, it's actually passed, and he knows he's not playing, I think he's just going to, you know, set his mind to that and just get ready for next season. Hopefully, what he doesn't regret doesn't mean that it's not still going to affect him because it can still affect him. Um, it's a business at the end of the day, although everybody knows that you want your money and you deserve your money. But at the end of the day, a lot of teams may still look at it like, are you a team player? Are you just going to hold out whenever you don't get what you want? You know, so it can have a catch-22 effect to it. Um, but at the end of the day, the, the caliber of a player that he is should speak louder than that. But we'll see. You know, I don't think he'll regret it. I don't think he'll regret it either way um, because he, he's, he's committed to it at this point. He's done it. There's nothing else to go back with. And I think that he would have thought about all those things before this time has come. Yeah, um, he doesn't strike me as a guy who did this on a whim. Uh, you know, this decision to begin with. Uh, I know everyone's focused on the financial thing. That's his pockets, his problem. I'm not getting into that at all. Um, he seems like he's he's comfortable with his decision. Um, I respect it, and I mean, that's pretty much it for me. I don't think he has he's going to have any regrets. I agree with what you said, Octavia. The NFL is the NFL. They're going to find any type of way to not pay you what they feel you're worth. Um, so, I mean, but again, I feel like that's a part of it that he's already thought about ahead of time, and, you know, it is what it is. I said it, man. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, LeBron James on free throw struggles. I'm garbage. Uh, I suck from the free throw line right now. I'll get my rhythm back. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Are we allowed to say that? Because, you know, like no, when we, we say, we, if we yeah. say anything like that, you know, LeBron said it, so I can say it. Too. Maybe you can smooth it over by saying, go, James. You know, <laughs> oh, that's what people okay. want to say. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I mean, LeBron said it, so I can say it too. Yeah, so, but no. Uh, I think that, I mean, it's big of him to come out and admit because, like we just said, a lot of players that are, you know, heralded or, you know, superstars don't really admit to their faults a lot of times. But for him to be able to step out and say, yeah, my, my free throw shooting has been terrible. Like, I need to get it together. And we always have wanted him to take responsibility for situations that he is involved in. So for him to step out and say, yes, this is something that I need to improve on, you know, hopefully it's a triple effect down to everybody else. I'm like, well, LeBron said he need to improve on that. Maybe I need to improve on this too. Um, it, to me, it's a step in the right direction of him being a better leader, especially with a lot of younger players around him. But it is what it is. If, I mean, even if he said it or if he didn't say it, numbers don't lie. So, yeah. I mean, it means nothing <laughs> to me at all. Like, we can see the numbers. So that you pointed out an obvious thing. That's cool that, you know, you cited it. And I feel like it was just something that was said. So maybe he'd stop getting asked questions about it. Maybe. Um, but that's just where my cynical view on it is. So. I mean, for me, it's just like, honestly, what else is new? <laughs> not, not hating. It's just he, he's always been up and down from the mm -hmm. line. It's just you look at his career for free throw percentage. That's why it's hard for him to close games. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't want to admit it. They want to look over those shortcomings. But, you know, even when they won championships, there were other guys closing, D-Wade, uh, Kyrie. Those guys will hit shots in the free throw line. I even, uh, you know, I like another podcast, Jalen Jacoby. Jalen Rose is like, I've been saying for years, I will hack him in the late minutes. Yeah. He said, I'd rather have you on the line than coming up court. I could see you. You gives my team a better chance of winning. Obviously, teams haven't caught on to that yet. But, I mean, just for the people to know how bad it's been, it's been so far this month, uh, in five November games, he's shooting just 63% from the line. Um, and he's one for six from the line in the final minute of a one-possession game this season. They're seven to six. So that's yeah. literally the difference between being out the playoffs in the West and definitely mm -hmm. being out the playoffs and being getting a decent seed. And if you're going to be a leader, you got to own those things, the, your, your shortcomings and stuff, because, like, especially when they're going to put the ball in your hand to create something. You yeah. got to be able to deliver. Otherwise, they're going to be looking like, man, look at it, man. You, we losing games. You Give me the ball. And then that will cause friction and stuff like that. So I'm glad he, he's saying something. I'm just looking for the more important thing. That's one bad area, but he, he, he <laughs> the defensive end. Mm -hmm. That's the next I'm, thing I'm looking at that, about. you know, because that's, that's equally as bad. But, you know, I guess one step at a time. You know, <laughs> um, Last question. <laughs> uh, I'm going to end it on a good note. Uh, tonight's Rutgers women's basketball head coach, yes. Vivian Stringer, she has a chance to get her 1,000 win. 
uh, she does. It would make she would be the first African American coach to do so. You know, how big is this? That's super big, especially with you know how hard it is for African Americans to get head coaching positions. Mm -hmm. Although they put in rules and, and things like that, you know, but. It's a it's a great feat, you know. A lot of players, a lot of coaches don't even get that many games to even try to get anywhere near that type of a record. So it's definitely something that should be applauded. Oh yeah, it's monumental. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, something people don't like to do these days is you have to, you know, see or, or respect excellence, mm -hmm. and you you hit that mark. That is that is a, a, an example of excellence. A certain point that you've reached. Only five people have been there before. You're the first of. You are a race to do that. Um, she deserves it. I hope they do get that win tonight. And the other thing is, as Octavia cited, it's hard for African-American coaches, no matter the sport, to retain jobs. Um, so for her, and it hasn't always been great, you know, during a career where it's always a good year. You know, good years, bad years. She's battled through a slump and come out the other side. Um, definitely commend this, and it's always cool to see someone make history. I mean, she's one of the greatest to ever do it. Yeah. Uh, she don't get enough praise, obviously, because women's basketball undercover. Um, and then it always start with Gino past time. And I, I mean, rightfully so, then you work your way down. But she's in that conversation with those guys. Mm -hmm. I mean, with, it, it's um, – She's, she's the first coach, men's or women's, to take three different programs to the Final Four. That's crazy in itself. And, and it's more than just wins. Look at the people you've impacted. And her, her impact, her DNA is all over the women's game. Yes. Look how many countless pros she done pumped out. A lot of people may not even know. You know, Cappy Pondexter, who might be the best she's coached. Uh, Essen Carson, Kia Vaughn, Epiphany Prince, Kalea Cooper. Yeah. Cobham, I'm sorry. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's countless pros, and they keep coming. So... That's her impact on the game. She's already been a Hall of Famer. She went in with the Jordan class, Stockton, those guys. Um, I'm just happy. I'm hoping she get it so she can really get her to do. And, you know, the whole world need to, you know, shout praise upon her. Because that's, like you said, that's hard to do. But it's even harder for African-American women to do. Yeah, we want to thank you guys for tuning in. Um, as always, we truly appreciate your continued support. Uh, get over to findersmag.com, mymodelsports.com, and definitely follow the Focus TV on Instagram and Twitter. And we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks because, you know, we, we got to work next Tuesday. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what it comes down to. We will be at work next Tuesday. Thank you guys for tuning in.